Welcome to the People Data for Good podcast with Al Adamson. Welcome back. I am here with Sanya Lucina, president of Question Pro Workforce, and most importantly, a longtime friend and all around awesome person. Sanya, how are you? Oh, I'm doing absolutely fantastic, Al. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for taking time out uh, to share your story uh, with us here from Buenos Aires, Argentina. <laughs> but yeah, how is it down there right now? You know, it is absolutely gorgeous, which I think is contributing to my good mood. It's sunny. It's beautiful skies. I just looked out the window and I can see the moon. It's 2.30 in the afternoon here, but I'll take it. Weirder <laughs> things have happened this year. Uh, we had some rain last year, but or last year, last week, but this week it's just been really nice. So I think it's contributing to the the uplifting, optimistic mindset. I'm very proactively trying to set for myself these days. So <laughs> great weather, good mood, no complaints today. <laughs> well, in terms of mindset, well-being, uh, <laughs> what engagement looks like in remote work, I mean, you have studied it all. Uh, for those who are in the people and loose community, uh, you're well known, you're known well. Um, and with those without outside the HR community or people in this community, they might not know you as well. Um, so if you would, a quick introduction of who you are and uh, a little bit about your background. Yeah, oh, well, thank you. I, I feel like I've, I've had such a privilege of talking with you so much, you know, over the last several years, and I think especially lately, and I will thank my lucky stars for no travel, um, although I miss it dearly, but it gives me an opportunity to just look at your calendar and pop a one-on-one, -on -one and, and then we talk about life, and um, so I'll, I'll try to be a lot more concise than how much you know about me at this point, since we've had so many conversations, but um, so I am originally from former Yugoslavia, from Serbia, born and raised in Belgrade, moved to the States in 92, um, unfortunately because of the war, but it gave me an opportunity to experience a different continent, uh, finish several degrees. So I went to University of Michigan for undergrad and I went on wanting to be a medical doctor because I wanted to help the world and I have several doctors in my family and I thought this is it. And oof, that phone call to my parents freshman year when I realized that I fainted the side of blood, that chemistry is not my jam, the biology I'm not nearly as good at as other things. And at that point, I, I did a little bit of soul searching and was introduced to this area of industrial and organizational psychology, which I thought, what in the world is this? Um, and I, because Michigan is such a big research institution, I had this incredible pleasure and luxury of working with some really phenomenal professors that got me really passionate about the field. And so I decided to go on and get my PhD in organizational psychology after that, because realizing based on my undergrad work that if I wanted to do the profound and deep research that I had had my heart set on, that I needed to get some more formal training. And so my life took me from Michigan, from the beautiful Ann Arbor to the incredible Chicago. So <laughs> <laughs> academics have definitely been kind to me as far as the places that I've been to and then people that I've met. And so I finished my PhD in, in Chicago. I, you know, I, I always tell when I, a lot of times when I talk about people analytics, I say this as a joke, is that after so many statistics classes in graduate school, and when I started to look for a job, I said, nothing with numbers. I don't, I don't want to do numbers. I want to do leadership development and motivation and all these different things. Just don't put me in front of numbers. And now you know me, numbers <laughs> is in my life. So I met this incredible woman who was building a business unit at Career Builder. And she wanted me to build a talent intelligence business unit. And this was back in, in 2008. And I always joked before, like the data was really cool. We didn't really have online data portals. And I thought I just, uh, she was just incredible. This like inspirational woman, so much energy. I loved her vision for what she wanted to, to build. And I thought, okay, I think she's talked me into this. And then, you know, ever since it's been my, my love affair with people analytics and the different ways that data can really impact our lives. And then really quickly, I'll fast forward through <laughs> the next few years of my life. I, I decided to go get back, go and get an MBA, um, which 
a lot of people looked and they're like, but you just finished your PhD like two years ago. I'm like, I love school. I love learning. I'm running a business unit and I'm an academic and I mean, they've got to know more about marketing and operations and sales. So I went over to Kellogg and again, it was a life transforming experience. It was a cohort of a little bit more than 70 people. Um, you know, with origins all over the world and just brilliant professors and really eye-opening. And at that point, I, oh, I just had this big pull of wanting to go back to Europe. I had lived at that point all of my adult life in the United States, but there was just something about my roots that I thought, oh, I just, I want to give this another shot. I love that continent. And so finally, after much negotiating with the Curvilder CEO, he gave me an opportunity to move to London. And, oh, that was incredible just do being able to do business in the UK but then also in France and Germany and Greece and going to the Middle East like I felt so incredibly lucky because I got to work on labor market analytics I got to understand people um, but I got to experience all of these different nuances of different cultures and how people thought about those matters how organizations thought about those matters so it was this beautiful combination of what I was professionally passionate about and what I was personally passionate about and I thought I'm here I've arrived London Europe and then as you know life throws funny things on you I fell in love with an Argentine yeah packed up my suitcases literally three suitcases <laughs> <laughs> and moved over to the beautiful Buenos Aires Argentina not speaking a word of Spanish I did a little bit of Rosetta Stone but let me tell you a little <laughs> tricky <laughs> um, and I've been here for the last six years just you know absolutely loving it I when I think about and we'll get back to mental health and well-being and all those things that you asked about too to me it's it's almost a daily practice because I think about some of the life transitions that I did and I remember when I was talking to a friend and they said ah, oh, you move around so much. Like, are you running away from something? You know, it's, it tends to be what, how people think about it. And I said, you know, I always feel like I'm running towards something. Mm. And sometimes it's easier and sometimes, but it's, it's always been, it's not about what I need to leave behind, but this thing that I want to go towards. Now, is that true? Is that maybe a mindset? I don't know, but that's how I felt I've experienced it. And it's always, you know, when I left the US, I have family there I have incredible friends and great relationships and that was not easy and the same thing for London I was saying I just I loved being there I met again incredible people over the two years I loved the job that I was doing but there was something and someone I fell in love with even more and so I said I have to go try it out so here we are <laughs> here we are that, here that's we like are more like personal story in a nutshell and we'll talk more professionally but i always i always give that background because depending on the context that people are meeting me in like you know they say you know you say argentina and people will assume or i'm argentine and i'm not and then a lot of times people will hear my accent and you know say it sounds you know a little bit different but you sound pretty american and i've spent a lot of my time there but it's not my entire story um so i actually quite like my story i think it's a little crazy it's a little different but it's such a big part of my identity and who i am so whenever i have an opportunity i love to share it um yeah, because I, I think it's kind of fun and maybe for people that are considering a bold move especially when maybe maybe many people are thinking about these days what the data research tells us is maybe if I can give somebody, you know, a little bit of confidence or inspiration to take a chance on something they're really passionate to do, I would love to even be like 1% of what pushes somebody to be bold and, and take a chance on something they want to do. Well, let me translate that in <laughs> short. Um, from my perspective, uh, you're a badass. <laughs> that's, that, that's what I take. <laughs> this you is why we're friends because you're so good to me. One of the many reasons, but oh, you're the best. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, I, cause, and let, let me break that down concisely and, and clearly, particularly for our listeners who, you know, are just you know, getting to know you for the first time is that you have persevered, uh, through struggle, um, you remain a consummate learner. So you embody growth mindset. Mm -hmm. You also embody compassion and, and uh, what I would say, and I'm trying to refrain from using this word because we'll talk about it, um, <laughs> uh, is, is empathy. Um, and not only you know, being kind and, and compassionate uh, in this regard, but when you learn, you 
have to find courage to take a bold and appropriate action, um, sometimes yeah. for yourself, sometimes for your team, sometimes for your family, sometimes for your organization, sometimes for society at large. And not to say all our decisions are perfect, uh, but you are not afraid to go into the unknown. Um, so this is where I want to you know, take the conversation is that here we are, uh, September 2021, having this conversation. There's a great deal of uncertainty in the world. Yeah. Um, leaders are uncertain. Workers are uncertain. We'll talk about the great resignation. Yeah. Talking about you know uh, you know how women have left the workplace uh, in droves. You know all these concerns, and we are in uncertain times. So it's going to take mm -hmm. arguably courageous decision making by individuals and leaders. But in order for that to happen, there needs to be a real kind of compassionate curiosity about where we are in the world mm -hmm. and where we want to go. And similarly, where we want to take our organization. So if you would, can you speak to where I just went to regarding the need to be courageous and need to have that growth yeah. mindset? And you might start with defining what empathy at scale means to you because that's your yeah uh thank you and i love that you love it because it, it was something that was really near and dear to me so i in all of my courageous moves um i decided to switch jobs last december even though i loved the job that i had and you and i worked you know collaborated a ton when when i was at globe end so again it was not running from something but i a dear friend of mine of now nearly 15 years vivek reached out to me and i had worked with him as a client at Question Pro, and he asked, would you join my company? He's the founder and CEO, and would you run this team? And if you want to stay in Argentina, great. If you want to move back to the US, great, you know, but I would love to have you on board. And I thought, huh, interesting. You know, do I, it, it's such a challenging time, but I've worked with Vivek before. I loved what the company stood for. And to me, because Question Pro really focuses on survey research. And from, in my personal experience, professional experience and research, how you connect with someone is so profoundly important. How you listen to them, how you ask them, creating a space where they feel like they can share as much or as little about themselves as they want to in that point, but being there for them. Mm. And for me, it was always, it, it took a lot of learning and I'm still learning and always in the back of my head when I'm having a conversation with someone that they're opening up and being vulnerable. I have Brene Brown in the back of my head, like, is this like, this is what empathy is. Like, don't, don't look for silver linings. So I feel like I'm constantly practicing how, to, how am I the best person for somebody to connect with, but it's not easy. And I think it's something that we're always learning and it's something that we're always evolving. And that's where I, that idea of empathy at scale came, you know, about that I fell in love with is that I, you know, as you mentioned at the beginning, I ran the workforce business unit at Question Pro. And really what our, what our goal is, is to partner with organizations and help them best connect with their employees in such a way that, you know, surveys have been around forever. Surveys were the key measurement instrument I was using when I was getting my PhD. And I think even for decades before that, but a lot of times they were, you know, looked at in a little bit of a dry form. You had all of your different scales. It was agreements. You had different, you know, make sure you don't ask a double barreled question and all of those things. But it wasn't so much about how you made a person feel. It wasn't so much about the, the situation that you were setting and how you were connecting with them. And so that's what we really wanted to do. And in the time that so many people are going through so many changes, and I'll, I'll touch on I think resilience now and, and you know, the resourcefulness and courage is that I, I do think I'm, you know, over the years, yeah, I'm pretty resilient. And a friend of mine shared a quote, I think it was on Instagram or somewhere, and it said something along the lines of like, I'm tired of being resilient. Like, I just want a moment to rest. And I'll, I still get emotional because I'm like, yes. <laughs> I look at that quote and literally tears went down my eyes. I'm like, I'm tired. Like I fight and there are things that I love, but I just need a break. Can I not fight for a minute? Can it just be easy? Can it not? 
and so in a lot, like when I do tell my story and the fact that I'm, I'm very happy with my life and I feel very lucky is that I don't want people to ever think that for somebody that's been this fortunate, it's never difficult. And that you mm. never have the moment that you just think, I don't know if I can do this and I'm exhausted and I just need to pause. And then that as humans, we have self doubt around, no, but is now a good time to pause? Like, am I, you know, am I disappointing myself? Am I disappointing my family? I have a team. I have an entire business team that I can not disappoint all these people, but we can't, we're humans and we need that pause and we need, we need that compassion and we need that understanding and we need to know that somebody cares mm -hmm. and so that's what you know i've <laughs> why i switched to question pro from another job that i loved is that it gave me the opportunity to connect with people and to help organizations connect with that, and their employees on that level to mm -hmm. create that space and say we're here for you mm -hmm. however long you're with us and we hope you're going to be here for a while, but however long or short where your organization of choice, we want to be there for you. We want to create the right space. And so what questions do you ask to connect with people? And I was saying, even in my personal life, like I'm always thinking like, do I ask this? Is it too personal? But it does it allow a person the space to open? And then how do I input this information and do something about it? And it's, when you think about it, it's the same as with friends. When somebody is telling you what they're really excited about, what their challenge is, you're taking it in and say, well, what do I give back? Mm. As, as a person that really cares about someone else, what do I give back? And so think about, and a lot of times as friends, we can give back something. Maybe it's not everything because maybe a person is opening up about things that we can't impact in their lives, but we can be there. We can be there as support. But one thing that I love is the, just the ability that organizations have to act on the information that their employees give them. And that oftentimes it's not revolutionary changes. It's not a significant money investment, but it's just understanding really truly who is on the other side and what can I do with that information? And to me that, that it's brilliant having that ability to impact that many people's lives and even more so if you can effectively connect with them. So you can tell I love what I do. <laughs> so I, I feel so incredibly lucky to have that opportunity and so incredibly like we, over the past couple of weeks, we've had a lot of conversations with our existing clients thinking about, you know, strategically, what are they focusing on for the rest of the year? Have they had a chance to think about 2022? And, you know, some have, some haven't because oh, 2021, come on, come on. <laughs> um, but just really, you know, talking through that and saying, how do we best support them? How are we the best partners? It's incredible because all of these organizations, the, the thing that I love about our clients is by and far their clients because they care about their people. Otherwise they wouldn't be. So we're already like, yes, like we have this incredible group that we're talking with and now how can we be the best possible partner for them to impact all of these people that they have the ability to make their lives better and happier and make them more engaged and productive and all those things. I will pause there. You know, you know me by now. You know what you get yourself into when you ask me a question. Like I can't. No. It's like I'm gonna cry with you. I'm gonna laugh. <laughs> well, I think in these last ten minutes, you got a little bit of everything. <laughs> you know, I, I I don't have to remind you of Ralph Waldo Emerson's quote: "Is nothing great was ever created without enthusiasm." And you obviously bring your passion and enthusiasm to your work and it's contagious and it's beautiful and I celebrate it. You know, that's what I'm here to do in part. So you know, one of the things that I want to explore with you is, is this, is with remote work, uh, with people having more virtual meetings, more meetings in general, um, and meanwhile, they have constraints behind them, whether it be kids, elder care, you know, taking care of the house, whatever it, it might be, is it has compromised our well-being as workers. Uh, and you and I have discussed this at length, is there's much to do in the broad discourse in HR around skills and capabilities. But what is underappreciated is capacity. We only have so much time and we only have so much energy to give. And as a team leader, as a supervisor, manager, whatever you want to call it, 
I'm not a trained therapist. I can't go into each meeting and <gasps> ask how you're doing and spend 20 to 30 minutes, you know, governing other people's lives and holding that space. Meanwhile, trying to take care of myself. Meanwhile, trying to do my job. Meanwhile, you know, trying to take care of my kids and all this. So we are in this place of collaborative overload to use Rob Cross's yes. word. We're burned out, you know, and we're, you know, dying for a paycheck you know, to quote, you know, Jeffrey Pfeffer. Yeah. So um, I know you are trying to address uh, this pervasive problem across yeah. not only uh, North yeah. American society, but across the world. And so yeah. when you talk about empathy at scale, correct me if I'm wrong, it's really about not only enabling managers or supervisors to be more focused and effective at elevating engagement and well-being, but it's creating a system, it's creating a culture where that yeah. becomes the norm. Um, and yeah. the organization has the capacity and capability to deliver um, processes mm -hmm. and experiences that are, are healthy. Can you speak to, to that? Like if an organization has empathy at scale, what does it look like to you? Yeah. Oh, I have so much to say about that. I don't like my mind. Like I, I should have taken notes. So I know where to start. <laughs> um, I, I mean, you have no idea since the first time that you and I talked and you brought up capacity to me, how many times I've repeated it to people, because mm -hmm. I think it's such an important concept. And I think that it's something that's not fixed for any single person. It's not the same between people, but it's not also same within the person. Um, there is, when it comes to organizations, there's so much that organizations can do. Like the first thing that I, I usually say to is for a company to understand who am I, who do I want to be to my employees? Like, do I want to be somebody flexible? Do I want to be somebody that will stand more for in-person collaboration? Do I want to be somebody that's going to be working from anywhere or we're not for different reasons? Like I don't, believe there is one exact philosophy that everybody is going to follow like I don't think in all the research that we're doing I don't think we're looking to aim towards that where one day I'll be publishing a paper that's going to say this is you know your blueprint to having a successful organization this is exactly what you do and a lot of times I compare that to humans then mm -hmm. no two of us are exactly the same and if I think about it you and I've talked about the four burners theory and you know what do you focus on and in a specific moment and how does that fluctuate or what do I want to be known for? I want to be known for, for my work in, you know, in, in my field that I, I look at happiness at work. I look at productivity. I look at well-being and, and mental well-being and all of those kinds of things. Um, I'm never going to be an accomplished athlete, not in my genes, not something I've spent time on and I'm okay with that. And those are, you know, different polar, polar things. And so I think for organizations now, if you look in the media, there are so many headlines around what are, you know, this is what Google is doing and this is what Facebook is doing and this is what Twitter and this like, and so when these really big, really successful organizations, especially are highlighted, a lot of times the rest of the organizations feel the need, like, how do I live up to that? How do I match up to that? But in the research that we've done, of course, more people will, you know, are saying today, I want flexibility in time and in space. And like, I want um, you know, meaningful work. And of course, I think that's generally across the board, but then there are also these things that are, you know, lower in the scale, but that it still people are looking for. So we don't all have to compete on the same thing. We don't all necessarily have to give flexibility if we're transparent on who we are. And then we have that conversation with our existing employees. We have that conversation with people that we bring in and we know that this is the certain culture we have, but also doing that research and legwork to understand what's meaningful to people will be at all easier than to understand if you're having a harder time attracting talent because maybe the pool of people that wants to work under those circumstances is smaller. They're there and you're choosing to be that organization, but just know like what you're setting yourself up for. Um, when it comes to mental health and well-being, ah, like that is like a, I don't know, a hundred hour conversation, but I'm trying to make it shorter. I think that as um, organizations like and as people, we're really starting to unpack that. And we're really starting to understand and allow ourselves in many ways to say, what does that mean? When do I need to be strong? When do I need to get help? What kind of help do I need? Is it from the organization? Is it from me personally? Is it both? Because I also think 
one of my big philosophies in life that I think has helped me, maybe sometimes it's hurt me too. I'll, I'll be honest with that. But like, I think it's mostly helped me is that no matter what I face, success or failure, I contribute to what I did. Why? Because I have full control over that. I don't have control over external circumstances. I don't have control, but how I think, how I act, how I re reevaluate is 100% mine. Why do I say that? Because I do think organizations have a big responsibility to step up for their people. And I, um, oh, this makes me so emotional too, but in, in the last couple of months, like it's, it's incredible to me how many of my team members have said, thank you for this and thank you for being understanding. And I can't believe I can have this kind of conversation with you. And it makes me so emotional because I can't believe that that's so far from the norm. Mm -hmm. That it's, I, and I'm not, trust me, like I'm not doing anything like so outstanding or so revolutionary and being a human mm -hmm. with them and I'm listening and I'm understanding them. And I just think, oh man, like we've got, like <laughs> we have to help people make this more normal. Um, but I do think, you know, you mentioned leaders and you mentioned managers and, and I was in, um, in a conversation recently where somebody said a lot of this, you know, is on managers and how they connect. And like you said, like, we're not therapists and it's really, it, we can't ask our managers for that. We can't, it, you've got to go to do a lot of school to be a therapist. It's not, <laughs> I'm a psychologist, I know. I don't know, a whole PhD and I'm not even a therapist. Um, so I think we need, to, <laughs> we need to find some, some common ground where we're creating that understanding again, that empathy at scale to understand this is the culture that we've looked to build. This is the promise that we're making to our employees. Are we living up to that promise? What does that promise look like to them? So when we, you know, in our executive teams make definitions and say we want to support something and we think about how we execute it, I will tell you more often than not, like so many culture surveys that I've analyzed and looked at, how big of a difference there is between executive opinion on something and when you go further down to the individual contributor. And it's on that maybe that abnormal we're exposed to different information our roles are different like there, there are many different factors but I think for organizations to understand the more likely than not that's happening for them as well that if you have an executive team and a small task force that's going to say yeah you know well-being is going to be our one of our values and we're going to do this this and this you've got to ask people You've got to validate it. You can't assume that the way you're operationalizing it is what works for your people without having that conversation. Like it is, that, that's a really big miss. And then I think also iterating on it because you and I, I think not, I don't know, do we talk weekly? Like maybe, I think we're almost <laughs> a weekly, but definitely monthly, you know, it, it's pretty frequent. And you can probably say you've caught me like in very different moods and in very different mindsets and with very different challenges. And I've worked through specific things, you know, at work, I've worked through many things personally. Um, and so that's, that's one, you know, I kind of taking the loop of my answer and then I'll give the mic back to you so you can refocus me is that the personal responsibility is that there's going to be so much going on in our lives, so much. And I think it's okay for us to ask for our organizations, for our leaders, for help. We can put it all on them. There is, you know, whether it's well-being from a physical fitness standpoint, mental health standpoint, I've always, you know, talked about like you don't have a sports team without a coach. So in your life, whether you're going to have a life coach or a therapist or somebody to help you. I think is really valuable. And I think the stigma around it is very different, the different continents I lived on. And in Argentina, everybody has a therapist and they build their like, you know, cocktail time or like, oh no, sorry, like I have a therapy session, you know, can we do drinks at eight? Like, and I love that. Like I celebrate that to the fullest. So I think that it's it's wrong for organizations to think when it comes to well-being that it's completely on the people and that like, oh, if, you know, if we give yoga or if our people like, if we give a voucher, you know, to somebody to go take a yoga class, that'll be fine because so much of it goes back to capacity and what you were saying, how are we setting up our culture? What are we asking of our people? How are we practicing empathy of, at scale? How are we having that two-way dialogue? And then at the same time, it's for people to take things that they can um, into their own hands and say, wow, I feel really supported by my organization, but here are the things that I know I can impact myself um, that are going to rebuild that foundation. I was actually recently thinking, um, I was talking to my therapist and she asked me, what do you do for fun? We just started the two of us. And I thought, fun, lady, 
it's September of 2021, nothing. Like, is anybody having fun right now? Like, come on. Um, I joke, partly. I probably do a lot fewer fun things than I did before the pandemic and before I, you know, had a toddler. The fun looks very different these days. Yeah. But when I decided to work with her and I started exercising again, oh, <laughs> the muscle pain, but, but I did all of that. And to me, it's because I had this moment where my personal decision was I need to rebuild a foundation of the house. That's how I'm looking at it. And when she talked about fun, I love taking Mateo out and I love going out with Martine and spending time with our family and our friends. But a lot of times I was, you know, getting sucked into different things or I was doing things around the house or it was just easier to get wrapped up in a million, million different things that we need to do. Um, but I thought, okay, no, I'm going to exercise and I'm going to have more energy and I'm going to talk to someone because then I can, you know, organize some things in my mind better and prioritize things better. And uh, I think the space that'll open up for fun and all these other things will be incredible because if you think about having a party, like it's hard if your floor is cracking and if your ceiling's leaking, it's hard to entertain a bunch of people. But if you fix all of that foundation, it's so much more enjoyable. It's so much more, you know, easier to open up. And so that's, I was thinking about it this morning as I was doing my insanity exercise. <laughs> I needed to get my mind off like the squats and the jumps. And I was like, yeah, I think this is good. Um, so yeah, it ebbs and flows, but there, there is a bunch more information at you. <laughs> well, about, your question <laughs> well you're bringing a couple points to light that i want to highlight for our, our listeners and i want to get to one in a little bit and that's around employee experience and mm -hmm. you mentioned the promise and you know, there's so many terms and initiatives that are disaligned so i, I want to get to that within an organizational mm -hmm. perspective in a minute but before yeah. we go there i want to you know, talk about this notion that many leaders have both within HR and out that I have a hundred managers, I have a hundred individual contributors, I have, a, you know, 50 directors or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. And I look at all of them as roles that deliver outputs and there's this implication consciously or unconsciously that they're static that they're just things that do stuff and it doesn't appreciate the unique circumstances that those individual human beings live and what we have done is we've taken these blanket policies and applied them across an organization and hope that they work for 100% of the population or yeah. a certain percentage you know, thereof, and it might be 70% yeah. and that would be a win. So taking that as a, a premise, yeah, the other side is tailoring for each individual, which at scale is almost impossible. And that implies the individuals would want a tailored experience. Yeah. So if we compromise and say, okay, you know, we need to have systems and processes and technologies that can adapt, that can flex and create what I call organizational elasticity, then we can accommodate those who need more attention, yeah. may, maybe need to lighten their workload so they can attend to an event that happened in their life that is drawing their attention away. Yeah. But we've created so much inelasticity that if, if something happens in someone's life, you know, stuff breaks, you know, their well-being yeah. breaks, things don't get done. And so can you speak to your thinking on that? Is that, you know, how can we as leaders, given your experience and ideas, you know, be more aware of the need to create systems and processes that can ebb and flow as the needs of individuals, teams, and, and groups ebb and flow. Yeah, God, what, what an incredible question. I think especially in the light of organizations figuring out their working models now and the hybrid. And just yesterday I was having a conversation with someone that was saying that they have a group of managers that are nervous about always working remotely, whether it's collaboration with their people, whether it's accountability. And we talked a little bit about trust. Hmm. And the idea is how much trust do you, like if you have somebody that's relatively new, um, how much trust do you give someone? Is it all of it until it's taken away? Is it in the middle? 
and then you earn it or you lose it mm. oh, if you give no trust I think you're in big trouble so I, I, I almost don't even want to get like it I guess it's an option but I wouldn't want to think like, I would strongly right. discourage it because I do think that there's you know that that fear of transparency and accountability and I have a lot of people and how do I know and I have these big goals and I think things that I need to accomplish and and that whenever I, I've always had you in the back of my mind too when I thought about capacity when I thought about goal setting so the one thing just being a trained organizational psychologist you know I think if you woke us up like during our coursework we would tell you about goal setting and the importance of it and the clarity of it and the timeliness of it and so I think oftentimes we we try to put so many boundaries because we feel greater sense of control. So if I know that somebody is working certain hours, I feel like I'm, I'm, I maybe like have more ownership of that, or again, more control over that versus saying, this is what I need you to do this month. This is what I need you to do this quarter. And we're going like, this is like, I mean, like the, you know, sometimes performance management one-on-one, we're going to check in. But to me, what, what's crazy is how many of these recommendations we've come up with but in realistically how often people find a reason that it's really hard to follow. And I understand that maybe it's not a piece of cake. You have a big team, it's you know hard to do check-ins every week, but I think the end goal of having something like that is critical because then if you, if you have an understanding of what the end goal is, if you have that defined, if you have some timeline of agreeing I mean, it's like basic project management. Like this is, you know, for us to get at this end goal, these are the milestones we need to hit. And then what happens in between that, if you have those specific milestones, you can be a little more relaxed because if the first one is missed, then you can think strategically, how do we fix that? How do we get back on track? You don't have to worry, you know, two months, three months, six months going by and you're not realizing that something's not progressing as it should. But I think that allows for internal flexibility to not, to people not manage so much. Now, Recently, I, I was talking with one of my college roommates and a really dear friend of mine, Kelly Wilson. She's a professor at Purdue University. And with a couple of her colleagues, they did research on how organizations can support working parents during the pandemic. And a brilliant paper, it was published in HBR. And one of the things I talked about that I like that I think could be even just translate, translated in general is having like a buddy system at work. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? That means that, you know, in their particular case of parents is like, oh, if you have a sick kid or you, you know, you have to leave the, like when that happens, when that phone rings, like you're out, like, I don't even know if you're saying goodbye. I don't know if you're telling anyone where you're going, depending on the situation, like your mind is there. And so it, it's this like agreement between people that if you and I are buddies and you get called away or I get called away, we'll know that each other is going to fill each other in on what happened at work. Like if I had to miss a meeting, you would tell me what happened. Um, if you had to miss something, vice versa. And so they had some of those interesting strategies that literally cost the organization nothing, but actually help people help each other. And it, it happens a little more strategically because maybe you do, you know, you just as a person choose a buddy at work. But if your organization encourages that, or if it maybe says like, hey, we'd love to know who's whose buddy or, you know, however you want to keep track of that. I think that creates this incredible network where people like have each other's best interests and heart, your relationships change differently. And even a lot of times, I, I do think, you know, leaders and managers have such a huge impact on their team, but I'll tell you that in a lot of my roles, like I've absolutely loved cultures because of people that I worked with. And maybe there were my peers, maybe there were people on my team, maybe there were you know, people in completely different departments, but those are still, also majorly the people that I stay in touch with all across the world. Mm -hmm. And so is there some way that we can, you know, organizations can more systematically help form those relationships until it becomes a little more natural? I thought, you know, the way Kelly and her colleagues talked about that was a really interesting angle. And one that I had, you know, like I talked to you about goal setting. All of us have heard that 50 million times. Maybe we keep, need, you know, needing to say it until we actually do it well. But I like this one because it was a little different and I thought it was practical and not one of those like, high in the sky, you know, ah, oh, you know, we could do that. Like, oh, we'll never accomplish this. This actually seems pretty realistic. And so I think, you know, one thing that I think we'll find out through research, and I don't have the answer for yet, is when you think about the flexibility and when you think about um, giving people that freedom, you know, whether it's like, I just want to show up to work, whether it's my computer at home or in the office and I want to work and I want to go versus like, this is a big part of my life and I want to be friends. Like, 
I wonder, I think today it's all blended. So you don't think about, you know, and it's a little bit more culture driven, but I wonder if it'll maybe become more culture driven because the investment that organizations are going to make in technology and in processes and strategies to really give people more freedom, to allow people to open up. I wonder how much there's gonna be like maybe a clash between people that view their job as a paycheck in some way. And I, I don't, I also wanna be careful to say that that's a really bad thing because maybe it's not like people have different preferences and maybe people say, you know, I, I love the work that I do but I do a lot of things outside of work and I have a big family and I have a lot of friends. And so although I'm friendly with people at work, maybe these are not going to be the people closest to me. Like, I think right. that's okay. And then you have people that say, oh, I want to be best friends with those around me. I want to share everything. And they'll know like, you know, everything about my kid and everything about my spouse and, and all of those different things. So I think it'll be interesting to see how much without sacrificing, hopefully diversity and especially diversity of thought, how uniform we might make, make that across the organization versus like having people with these really different desires still co you know coexisting in the same organizational culture. Well, let, let me take off on, on that because in what you just shared, you mentioned goal setting, you mentioned a new program, you mentioned uh, digital transformation, um, you mentioned leadership, you, you mentioned uh, a variety of what I would call stakeholders that influence the employee experience. And so in most, and you mentioned diversity as well. So you, there's a host of things that are happening in any organization at any point in time. Uh, mm -hmm. Call them initiatives, call them, you know, functions that are doing stuff. And mm -hmm. I have seen, uh, like you, many organizations not have a cohesive strategy that appreciates how all these various initiatives affect the employee. Um, many yeah. then can get overwhelmed. Uh, they can get conflicting information. They ask, well, why the heck, you know, am I, am I doing this? So, you know, whether it be employee experience or culture strategy or people strategy, yeah. uh, what is your thought on the need for a cohesive framework that brings employee well-being together with performance together with diversity equity and inclusion together with yeah comp and total rewards and all the, these things that ultimately yeah. are going to be determinants of how people talk about their work experience um, their propensity yeah. to stay at that employer or with that team and ultimately do great work. I, I mean, yeah. what are your thoughts there for that, that governance structure? Yeah. So I think it's, you know, it, it, as I'm thinking through, it's always a sum of parts and those parts impact people differently. Sometimes it's easy to isolate how a specific thing impacts somebody. Sometimes it's a little more difficult. Um, I think it's important to think about it holistically. It's important to think about the different inputs. It's important to get people's feedback. Now, how much you can isolate what specific initiative. So it can be a combination, right? And I, my mind always goes to surveys because that's what I do all day, every day. But of course, we know there's plenty of other incredible data. And so, you know, you can look at things like participation rates and who participates with which frequency. Then you can say, okay, people are not participating in this program, maybe why? Is it because we're not communicating effectively enough? Is it because it's not serving people what they need? Because if you look at the data and you see signups are low, you could say, okay, we're cutting it, but really maybe nobody knows about it. And I've seen that plenty of times, like lack of awareness for specific initiatives. And then it's not a one size fits all. So that's one thing that we need to be so, so careful about that when we're creating these frameworks and structures that based on professions, generations, gender, like, what, there are a million different things that make a difference in how you want to participate, what you need for your well-being, what you need in a certain moment. So looking at that data in a more detailed way, I think is really critical before making any rash decisions and then also iterating on it, right? So if something is, is working, great, let's make sure we measure it. If something's not working, understanding the why behind it, and it could be many different things experimenting different ideas, because I think sometimes if you get a framework too, you gotta be careful that it doesn't stay super static, especially for something that's as dynamic as well-being, for something that's as dynamic as inclusion. And that we also 
don't only control it internally inside an organization, but there's this whole big world around us that's making decisions and making changes that people are aware of. So regardless of what we're doing inside our organization, um, we have to stay in tune with that as well because it's gonna have an impact on how our employees think about different things. So those are just like a, a few of the things that like come to mind when we think about frameworks, when we think about different approaches, when we think about iteration. And I always say this, and I'll mention it really quickly too, is I, I was pretty surprised in some of the surveys when we've done them, when we ask people, how well do you, you know, you think your company cares about you and how does your manager care about you? And it's like on a five point Likert type scale, it's like a 4.74, but like we, I feel like the company cares. And then how would you rate your well being? a three, a 2.5. So the, the difference between the intention and having the best interest and the actual impact of what the organization is doing. And so that's why like, I can't stress like experimenting enough, iterating enough. And I'll just one more example and then I'll stop talking is um, just that additive effect. So I mentioned I recently started working out and I'm trying to eat healthy. And I stepped on the scale the other day and I was like, I gained two kilos. You've got to be kidding me. How in the world is this possible? But it didn't make me stop exercising. It made me maybe think a little bit about what I'm eating, but I don't, you know, but, but there are all those additive things. And of course, Martin, the sweetheart he is, he's like, oh, but you're doing insanity. You built muscle. I'm like, dude, it's been two weeks. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've exercised in the past. I know I didn't get to but like him being like the nicest guy. He's like, don't worry, don't worry. Um, but there are also those kinds of things too, that sometimes you're, you're doing several things. And let's say like I lost two kilos, you know, is it because of exercise? Is it because of the food? Sometimes it's hard to isolate. And, and I think that that gray area is okay. I think if we're doing the very things, if our people are telling us that they're feeling okay, sometimes maybe we don't always have to have a perfect line to everything. If we think the mix of what we're doing is working. So I'll leave us at that for now. You know, I, I want to emphasize this point around surveys as a communication device to understand what you're talking about. Like there are, yeah. you know, so there's been standard surveys for a long time with normative data. There's this concept that is misunderstood around quote unquote employee survey fatigue. And we can talk about lack yeah. of action fatigue being the real problem. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, uh, you, your uh, PhD largely is around survey design, right? And yeah. it's asking question design uh, specifically. And so the reason I'm asking this, particularly with diversity, equity, inclusion, and creating feelings of belonging, is we're not going to know what's appropriate unless we ask the appropriate questions at the appropriate frequency to the appropriate audience. Yeah. And so this idea of taking this peanut butter approach and you know hoping the annual survey you know produces the right insights um, oftentimes is uh, erroneous. And so you know I think, you know, when we talk about onboarding surveys, we talk about maybe pulse surveys, talk about spot surveys to understand a certain dynamic or the yeah. effectiveness of a certain training program or a certain initiative. I, it might seem self-serving, but I, I want you just kind of to put that aside for a second, because yeah. we've talked about uh, the need to understand is rooted in yeah. ongoing communication. Yeah. And surveys are merely a means in which to have ongoing communication at scale. So yeah. can you speak to your, you know, your sales pitch, if you will, <laughs> for, for you know, in using surveys, which are data, which generate data, yeah. Um, yeah. to better understand what's happening and in turn, what appropriate action to take? Yeah, and you know, it, it's, it's interesting because I've worked with different data for so long and in the last, I don't know, five, 10 years, we've had this um, incredible influx of behavioral data that everyone's gotten really excited about and it's really meaningful. But again, I always like to try to give like personal examples and then bring them back to work. Like for example, if I was using um, a Fitbit or an Apple Watch and it was measuring how many hours I slept every night and maybe one night I slept six hours and another night I slept eight hours. And if I woke up and Martin didn't ask me, hey, how are you? Because he could see my watch and he's like, oh, she slept eight hours, she's fine. Or she slept six hours. 
but we know like our regardless of what that data point is we could be feeling very different because we maybe had an amazing dream or something great happened last night and we wake up full of energy even though it's six hours or five hours or we slept eight but there's something really weighing on us things can substitute a conversation they just can't i'm not saying that they're not meaningful but to actually ask an employee how are you in a way that they feel like you care in a way that they can communicate and open up, in a way that you're, to your point, you've thought through what is important for me to ask. And I was just actually talking with someone yesterday and we were talking about open-ended questions and how critical those are. And somebody who's been like, just in love with quantitative data because of the beauty of analyzing it. I have fallen in love with qualitative data too, and the ability to tell somebody, hey, we've asked you about these things. What did we forget? What else is important to you? Asking that in different kinds of ways. There is no substitute and somebody actually using their words to communicate their emotions. And you know, you say once a year, and I think it's it's tough because a couple of the double-edged swords that I've seen in some large, incredible organizations do their surveys once a year. And the reason is because of bureaucracy, because of the number of languages, because the amount of approval. And I just think, oh no, like I get it. And what a shame, like having like in a year, today a year is a lifetime. Maybe it was before and we just didn't notice it as much. But now like, if you look an average like tenure of a person in a company is two years. So you're essentially serving them halfway through before they're gonna leave. But the time you act on that data, it, it's too late. And so to me, that is, you know, why I do what I do, why I decided to take my career and, and my passion towards surveys, because I do think that while there is so many incredible insights and behavioral data and analytics that we should absolutely be looking at, there is no reason, I've not heard a good one yet, to say why we shouldn't be asking questions to our employees, why we, should, we shouldn't be doing it in a way that allows them to open up in a way that connects with them. Um, and that's if, you know, if you don't know what to ask, like most of us do, we just start and we open up and we ask about something else, but that shouldn't, it shouldn't be a roadblock. And I think that now more than ever, people want to be heard because all of us are going through so many life evaluations. What do I want to do? A lot of us, I think, or just a lot of people just want change for the sake of change because we're just so sick of the last year and a half bins. Like, I just want something to be different, but it doesn't mean that it necessarily needs to be a different job and a different career. And so that's that's why I think it's that important because there is, again, like I will keep saying it, no substitute and any data that we can have that's as powerful as really asking a person a question in such a way that they will open up and tell you what's going on, what their needs are. And then to your point around taking action on that data, it is incredible how often you see really simple things in data that as a company, you just overlooked because there's so much going on. You're like, I can change this in a minute. I just didn't know it was a problem. A lot of times organizations are so worried that any impactful change they're going to have to make is going to cost them a lot of time, a lot of money. But it's like, even like, again, in personal life, like sometimes it's just making a phone call to a friend. That's all they need. It's going to make all the difference in the world. It's going to cost you 30 minutes, maybe an hour, and it is going to make such a huge impact. So I think it's, it's really important for organizations to keep that in mind as well. I can talk about this all day. Thank you for asking me the question because it is, I, I do what I do because I think it's so incredibly important. I think there's still a lot of education to be done around it. A lot of giving people courage, helping them through thinking through things and, and understanding things. And I think that there's very few people who don't want to, people have, you know, maybe perceived reasons or challenges, whether it's timelines or budgets, that they're not going ahead with it. But I, I don't, I don't know if I've ever heard somebody say, oh, I think doing a survey is stupid. Thankfully, maybe somebody, probably somebody out there would, um, but I don't interact with them very often, or maybe they too feel too bad saying that to me. Um, but there are a lot of people that are saying, how do we do it better? How do we do it more effectively? And that's really where so much of question pros in my work is today is empowering those organizations, those leaders to practice that empathy at scale, to have better conversations, and then to really be able to see real impact on both their people and their business.
Well, Sanya, I, I, not only can I talk to you all day, I mean, there's things that we are doing together and that things that need to get done and that we're working on. Because what we're talking about here, for many leaders who have been around for 30 plus years, they're like, well, you know, I didn't need to do that back then. You know, I've been, you know, why, why do, why communicate more frequently? Obviously there's a new generation of high value talent coming through. We're in a new dynamic given remote work. So the thinking has to shift. And frankly, I would like to see the thinking and underlying processes and way of doing business shift as well, but I don't see it happening in most organizations fast enough. Yeah. So to your point, there needs to be more education, more creativity uh, applied. We're going to have to do this again. Uh, that's all I have to yeah. say as we wrap, because <laughs> I, I do want to explore more around employee experience and diversity, equity, and inclusion, particularly in remote work, how it's impacted women. I know you've done research in that regard as well. So for now, though, I'll say thank you. You're awesome. Um, you're badass, no doubt about it. And uh, how can people learn more about you and learn what you and Question Pro are up to? Oh, well, thank you, Al. First of all, it was a pleasure. You can definitely find me on LinkedIn, Sonia Lucina. It's a pretty unique name. I don't know if there's another one on there. Um, so you can find me there. I lead a group called Question Pro Workforce. We have a website. You can check us out online. Please contact me. I'm also Sonia.Lucina at Question Pro. I love talking with different people. I do practice what I preach. I'm, as we were saying, an eternal learner. So we just love to connect with organizations, connect with people, understand what are your passions, what are you trying to accomplish, and, and see if there's a way that we can work together. Hi, Sam. Well, thanks for being you. Thanks for sharing, and uh, look forward to talking soon. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Al. As always, uh, an immense pleasure to talk with you. All right. Likewise. All right. You be well. Bye. Thanks for joining the People Data for Good podcast with Al Adamson. To find other podcasts, videos, upcoming events, and to join the People Data for Good movement, please visit us at pafau.net.